God's beloved people, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to be with you today to share this beautiful space and to hear your voices. Even though we're not all singing together, it's good to hear your voices singing and to join our voices together. It is such a precious gift to be able to be together in person. And for those of you that are joining us online, we're happy that you're with us as well. And we look forward to the day that we can all be back in person together. Our gospel story takes place at a gathering of people. People weren't sitting in chairs like you are, nice and orderly, and working through a liturgy and um, following pandemic protocols. The Gospel writer describes a large, somewhat unwieldy, it sounds like, crowd of people that were clamoring for Jesus. It was a very diverse crowd from all over the area, all sorts of people from all sorts of places, Jews and Gentiles, urbanites and rural folks, some of sound mind and body, others who were suffering from various ailments. It was a very unlikely assembly of people, especially for those accustomed to following purity codes as part of their religious practice. The text is clear that this was a gathering of so-called clean and unclean, of devoted people, of those who were curious, and those who were skeptical and suspicious. I bet that nobody was wearing a mask. <laughs> this is the kind of gathering, to be honest, that I try to avoid. But Jesus isn't like me. He often found himself surrounded by crowds of people, all kinds of people. Word was out about him that he offered good news to the poor, liberty to those captive, sight to the blind, jubilee for all. Infused with divine power, he used this power to heal people, to cure them of their ailments, and to restore them to their relationships, to the communities from which they had been cast off. Word had spread and people responded in droves. I imagine it was a joyful, chaotic, energy-filled scene. It was also a teachable moment for the disciples they were brand new to discipleship. If you back up just a few verses, we hear the stories of the calling of the disciples, and, and they're listed in Luke's Gospel. They had just dropped their nets or closed their books or their tax ledgers or whatever they needed to do in order to follow Christ's call. They left behind what was familiar and comfortable, and now they didn't know where their next meal would come from or where they would lay their head. Friends and family members wondered if they had lost their minds taking up with this itinerant preacher, risking their safety and their reputation to join this Kingdom of God roadshow. In the midst of the hubbub, <clears throat> Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the Kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and defame you on my account. Rejoice and leap for joy, for your reward will be great. Jesus did not see the people around him as a gathering of deplorables. He saw them as the blessed ones, the fortunate ones is a good translation of this Greek word, fortunate. You are lucky to be in this place, he tells them, at this moment with these people, because here is where the kingdom of God is breaking in. Here is where lives are being transformed by divine mercy and grace. To underscore this unusual perspective, Jesus continued, woe to those of you who would rarely find yourselves in this place with these people. Woe to the rich, to the protected, the comfortable and secure, 
those with plenty to eat whose lives are filled with pleasure. Woe to you who would never risk losing the admiration of others, who are too insulated or privileged to stand on level ground with the sick and the suffering, the unclean, the cast-offs. Woe to you, for you will miss this moment. You will miss the breathtaking impact of the reign of God in Christ. Jesus drew a bright line in his preaching and teaching. I often hear him described as somebody with no boundaries, and I don't understand Jesus that way. It's just that his boundaries are in different places than mine are. I'm tempted to soften his words a bit, to buff the edges so they aren't quite so sharp. But this would not be faithful to Luke's story. This is the gospel, after all, that begins with a teenage girl singing about bringing down the mighty and exalting the lowly, filling the hungry, and sending the full away empty. The inbreaking of God's reign brings with it a great reversal. And how you experience this reversal depends on where you are located. I know where I'm located. I'm a white, middle-class, well-educated, able-bodied, cisgendered person. I know my desire for security and comfort. I have enough resource and privilege to choose who I want to be around and who I do not. I don't enjoy rocking the boat. I like it when people are pleased with me, when I earn their respect rather than their ridicule. As a Christian in this time and place, I have never been in danger because of my faith. I'm part of a dominant culture that shapes society to fit my beliefs and perspectives and traditions. Being identified as a Christian has costed me very little. I have had to risk very little. But being a disciple, answering the call to follow Jesus, this is more risky. I have so much to lose. Jesus calls me to lay down my idols, wealth, power, status, comfort, security. That to which your heart clings, Luther wrote, is your God. I have many gods by that definition. Jesus calls me to turn from them and he leads me to the margins where the blessed people are standing with open hands dependent on God's loving kindness. In order for me to be healed, Jesus calls me to stand in solidarity with societies forgotten, with those who, unlike me, are the most vulnerable. Jesus calls me to stand with them and says, Behold, the kingdom of God belongs to the empty-handed, to those who trust God's mercy more than their own abilities, who live each day not by their own accomplishment, but by the grace of God. We who are full have so much to learn from those who are not. For it is when we come to Christ empty-handed that the power of his promise becomes real. The same Savior who was healing people out in the desert is our Savior. He is the one who heals us of, his, heals us of our dis-ease and frees us from the unclean spirits that hold us captive. Joined to him in baptism, the steady flow of divine mercy has the power to cleanse us, heal us, and shape us throughout our whole lives. As flowing water can shape even the hardest of stones, the grace of God poured out for us in Christ has the power to shape us to be disciples, to be people of bold faith, bold hope, bold love, people of courage rather than comfort, blessed people who find their place right alongside others in this great, unwieldy, generous, diverse, jubilant reign of God. Thanks be to God for this mercy and for calling us to be part of this reign in Christ Jesus. Amen.